we are continuing our discussion on microfabrication. Uh, in the previous session, we were discussing about the uh, initial aspects of my microfabrication where uh, we try to understand what is the term microfabrication. And uh, following that, uh, we kind of made a differentiation between uh, the microfabricated devices and the microfabricated devices with several examples. And uh, following that, we have discussed um, what are the devices or what are the uh, systems that are made using microfabrication. And then uh, we went on to the uh, requirements for the microfabrication environment where, where we discussed that we cannot do microfabrication in a normal uh, room setting and it needs its own uh, uh, typical uh, uh, clean room for that matter. And uh, uh, where we discussed uh, like if you have a dust, if you have one dust that will significantly uh, influence the yield of the uh, microfabricated device. And following that uh, then we discussed what are the governing procedure that we need to follow in a uh, clean room uh, where uh, our head to toe should be covered very well because human beings are the biggest source of uh, contamination in a clean room. Um, and then uh, we had gone to the substrates where most of the substrates are in circular shape and we had discussed that that will be silicon mostly and in some cases they, they go for germanium and some cases they for th go for 3, 4, uh, three 5 semiconductors. Um, then we had discussed about the silicon wafer fabrication of how the wafer is made and then what are the different cleaning procedures that we need to follow. Uh, uh, before starting any fabrication or or these some of these processes some of these cleaning processes are uh, are routinely done in between the fabrication steps as well and then um, uh, following that we went for uh, wafer drying and then wafer handling methods and in this session uh, we are shifting our gear forward and uh, trying to analyze the different processes that are involved in uh, the microfabrication. Uh, of a particular device. When, you, when it comes to technology, people may think that uh, this is something that is beyond their scope. Maybe uh, most of the people who are not in this domain may think that this is something beyond their uh, scope of understanding, but uh, it is not the reality. So, uh, to prove this, I am uh, bringing few of the cases uh, in front of you and if you are familiar with uh, these day to day things you can easily understand what is microfabrication. The first point uh, is that uh, people must must have seen this uh, ice golem making that uh, a, a street vendor uh, do typically. Uh, what he or she does is that uh, they have a large piece of uh, ice cube and they must be crushing it by some mechanism and making it into a, into a shape and uh, following which they pour some type of uh, an additive or some type of a chemical or uh, some flavoring agent on the top of this that, uh, that changes the color of the ice. So, the moment that uh, the vendor pour this material this, this fluid on the top of uh, uh, the ice, uh, the ice that, the, that he made after crushing. Initially, it is not going uh, uh, deep, the, the solution is not going deep into the uh, ice. Instead, it, it is there uh, on the surface and it slowly start diffusing in. So, that process, uh, we have one process in microfabrication which is exactly similar to um, this particular uh, ice making process which is called diffusion, where uh, we will be incorporating some, uh, some agents uh, to to alter the conductivity or the type of the uh, semiconductor. So, if you know this particular uh, thing then you can understand a part of the microfabrication this is as simple as that. And second thing that I want to show is, uh, is some of you in the newer days may not be aware of this, but in olden days uh, before the start of uh, digital cameras people uh, used to use uh, film based uh, photography where uh, they, they used to install a roll of uh, film inside uh, the camera and then uh, following uh, that they will take this camera uh, to a scene and when they click that uh, this 
particular scene will uh, fall as a negative uh, on the film roll and then they develop this film roll and um, uh, print this uh, onto a paper. So, uh, here also when, when you are exposing your scene onto this photographic film, uh, basically the areas that are brighter will get exposed more and, and the, the, the scene which is uh, like the areas in the scene where it is dark uh, uh, will be exposed less and because of this intensity variation, uh, the, uh, the, the chemical on the top of the film will, will get reacted in a different way and then they will uh, use a particular solvent uh, for developing uh, and then they will uh, make the photograph out of this. There is a process which is exactly similar to this process in microfabrication which is called uh, photolithography where uh, we use similar light based technique to pattern a material called photo resist. We, we will be coming into that. So, this is the second thing where people if some of you have seen this particular process then um, you can understand another part of the microfabrication. And the third one is that if you have a habit of waking up uh, early in the morning and if you make your own coffee or your own tea, uh, then in the process of making the coffee or tea when you are boiling uh, water, you can see uh, that vapors start coming up right? uh, when, when, it, uh, when the water passes the uh, boiling point of uh, uh, its boiling point, uh, then vapors start coming. So, if you take a lid and, and try to show on the top of your uh, papers, after some time you can understand that you, you got a nice layer of uh, vapor on your, uh, on your lid. So, uh, if you keep for lesser time, uh, the layer will be very thin and uh, if you keep for longer time, the layer becomes thick. And exactly similar to this, we have a process. Uh, in microfabrication uh, which which is either called uh, which, which is uh, generally called uh, physical uh, vapor deposition and uh, uh, that is uh, basically used for uh, uh, depositing some of the metals. And if you know that such a thing uh, or if you have understood uh, uh, how this is happening in, in a real life situation, you will be able to understand and appreciate uh, that particular process in microfabrication. And another one uh, uh, that I want to take you people to is uh, stencil printing where uh, most of you must have seen uh, regular patterns on uh, some of our walls, uh, maybe in home painting also nowadays people adopt this technique. In that uh, we see beautiful uh, regular shape patterns uh, e like uh, placed everywhere on the wall without. Uh, without any uh, uh, deviation from one another like uh, from one corner to the other corner this looks alike. We must have wondered how they how they made this particular painting. This is made using a stencil where uh, they keep the stencil and then apply uh, the paint over this stencil. Uh, wherever you have uh, open area uh, that area uh, the paint will uh, stick to the wall and wherever you have the solid stencil material, uh, there uh, the paint will not go to the wall. So, if you know this process or if you have seen this process anywhere, then you can easily understand uh, another process in microfabrication which is called lift off, where, uh, where you want uh, to have metal on one on certain areas and you do not want metal on certain other areas. So, you use this uh, particular process. And, uh, Another and the last uh, day to day thing that I wanted uh, to introduce to you people is uh, the nail polish removal that some of you routinely do in your life, especially uh, girls uh, do this. Uh, uh, so, what they do is that they apply uh, nail paint on their uh, or nail polish on their uh, nail and then uh, when they wanted to change this, uh, they use either certain um, certain papers that has some solution on that or they will buy some solution and some cotton and apply this solution onto the cotton and then they will rub on their hand to uh, remove this nail paint. With this if you are rubbing only a part of the hand uh, maybe over there the nail paint will go and the uh, remaining areas the nail paint will, uh, will stay.
and if you want to remove it completely what you can do is you can uh, erase it everywhere or if you want to keep uh, your nail paint partially what you can do is that you can say cover the area where you want uh, the nail paint to stay uh, you cover it with some sticker or something and then uh, you apply your uh, your nail paint remover uh, and then uh, after clearing the unwanted area you can remove the tape so that maybe half of your uh, nail can have uh, the nail paint uh, staying there. Uh, exactly uh, the same way we have uh, a process in uh, microfabrication which is called uh, uh, etching uh, where uh, some part of uh, the metal uh, or some part of oxide or, or something oxide I will explain what is oxide later. But uh, if you want to uh, remove certain materials from one side whereas if you want to keep uh, the same material uh, without any damage in the other side you use a process called etching. And so uh, if you know this process also you will be able to understand like if you have seen this particular uh, nail polish removal in your life you can understand this process in microfabrication. Now, uh, moving slowly into technology. Now, uh, till this time I was uh, familiarizing some of the day to day um, things that we see to uh, microfabrication like uh, I, I was trying to correlate some of the processes, but you keep these processes in mind and later as and when in between the entire fabrication stage when these processes come up I will try to uh, say it is uh, matching with the, uh, the technique that I have uh, familiarized in the beginning. So, as I have mentioned uh, in my first uh, lecture, microfabrication can be used to make transistors or it can be used to make uh, solar cells or it can be used to make uh, micro electromechanical systems or uh, microfluidic channels and uh, so forth. Here uh, to make you understand each of the processes that are involved in the microfabrication I have taken one example. The example is a transistor uh, which is called metal oxide semiconductor field effect transistor MOSFET MOSFET MOSFET. So, um, if for your information uh, in all the processors that you buy nowadays like uh, all the processors that you have in your phone or in your laptop in, in your anywhere any, any system that has a transistor or maybe a MOSFET as its most fundamental uh, uh, unit. In the processor if you are opening the processor you can you can see a, a small piece of silicon and on this silicon there will be millions to say billions of uh, transistors uh, uh, fabricated. So, uh, transistor is the most basic element and uh, several uh, say millions or billions of transistors are placed or arranged and they are connected in a particular fashion to realize uh, different functions. So, uh, that particular uh, process is called uh, analog circuit design and realization, but I am not going uh, into that, but I will be sticking on uh, to how to make this MOSFET. I will not be uh, explaining how a logic is realized by uh, connecting these MOSFETs, but I will be sticking to how a MOSFET is uh, fabricated. So, if you look at uh, the present day MOSFETs, uh, you can see the 10 nanometer, uh, the 10 nm that I have written here. So, that is called the channel length. So, that is the channel of the uh, MOSFET and, and this 10 nanometer is the channel length that I have taken here. Say, um, in my previous lecture I had introduced uh, say dimensions to you uh, meter, millimeter, micrometer and so forth. So, nanometer is 1 by thousandth of a micrometer. So, to give uh, a feel of the dimension say one, one of your hair may have a thickness of 100 micrometers. So, if you are able to dissect your uh, uh, hair along its length not along its uh, width along its length if you are able to dissect say into 10,000 pieces or if you can dissect 10,000 times you will be able to get a hair of 10 nanometer. See, you, you, you can understand that it is so difficult to handle one hair with your hand. So, can you imagine uh, handling a piece of hair that has 
thickness that is uh, 1 by 10,000 of uh, a hair that is like you cannot see that also you will not be able to see that and how can you handle. So, that is the kind of uh, gate length that people have nowadays in their devices and this kind of uh, say billions of transistors are fabricated using this technique. Um, so, as I said if this uh, these devices were very big we should be able to make with our hand with, with our uh, say bare hands or with some tools uh, in our workshop. But since the dimensions are so small you have to make it with sophisticated instruments. And so in this MOSFET if you observe uh, for those people who are uh, not from uh, say electronics background I, uh, I will be uh, able to say only this that uh, the grey color that you see over here is called the substrate which is the silicon on which uh, all these things are realized and uh, the magenta color that you see here are called source and drain, source and drain of the MOSFET. Uh, so, uh, and on the top of that uh, the orange color that you see over here is called the gate oxide, it is called the gate oxide. And uh, on the top of gate oxide you can see a black color uh, strip which is called gate metal. And then uh, similarly you can see another uh, say black color uh, thing over the source and over the drain uh, which are called uh, source metal and drain metal. And uh, you can see uh, green color oxide spacers at the ends. So, that is to differentiate between two uh, transistors and you can see one long uh, strip of metal at the bottom which is called body contact. And when I am saying that I am going to fabricate this MOSFET, what I mean to say is that I am going to make all these structures, I am going to make all these structures on silicon, uh, but on a very uh, you know very uh, sophisticated way and that is uh, that we will deal on a step by step basis. So, we we will not be doing it at once we have certain steps that are to be followed. So, we will follow steps and then we will uh, finally realize this device. Um, if I mention about the uh, materials that are being used in this process mostly uh, group 4 uh, materials are selected as a substrate as I have mentioned previously um, either silicon or germanium uh, is taken as the substrate for uh, uh, microfabrication. And on this substrate if you want to make uh, the, these substrates are called uh, say pure semiconductor substrates which, which ideally does not have any conducting property because they have a valency of 4 and, uh, and they will not be able to conduct electricity uh, very well. So, if you want to improve the conductivity what you do is that you add um, certain other materials uh, into this uh, semiconductor substrate to, to alter its conductivity. Those materials are called dopants. So, either you can have uh, group 3 dopants like boron, aluminum, gallium, indium uh, or uh, you can have group 5 elements like nitrogen, phosphorus, arsenic, antimony or bismuth. But generally people will not use all these materials people if you want to go for group 3 uh, dopants people mostly go for uh, boron and if you want uh, to have group 5 uh, dopants people may go for arsenic or uh, phosphorus or uh, antimony. So, uh, these are the materials that are involved in uh, microfabrication and now we are going to uh, understand each and every process that are involved uh, in this microfabrication. The first process that we have is called oxidation. So, uh, when I explain all these processes for you to understand where are we going, I have kept uh, the final device at the bottom right corner. So, you can always look into that diagram that is the device that we want to make at the end. And now, uh, in the beginning what you have is that you can you, you just have a grey substrate that, that, that you see here. Um, and with this substrate how can you realize such a MOSFET is what we are trying to understand. So, uh, if I were to approach this problem the first thing that I want to have is the field oxide. 
the FOX that is so, uh, show over here is called uh, field oxide uh, or uh, the thing that I have shown in green color. And uh, the, the reason for uh, selecting silicon uh, for uh, all these microfabrication processes are two. The first one is the abundance of uh, silicon in the earth uh, and uh, the second one is, uh, is the easiness of uh, forming an oxide on the so top of silicon. So, uh, the process of forming oxide on the top of silicon is named as oxidation. Um, so, initially I have only a grape a piece of uh, silicon that is shown grey color and on the top of that I uh, will be growing a, a thin film of oxide. This oxide is silicon dioxide. So, silicon will be semiconducting in nature, but silicon dioxide or SiO2 will be insulating in nature. So, it is a dielectric and uh, the process of uh, forming this oxide is called oxidation and there are two types of uh, oxidation either you can do uh, dry oxidation or you can do wet oxidation. The difference between these two are uh, these in, in dry oxidation uh, the process involves only oxid oxygen because uh, it, it does not uh, form any, any liquids uh, or, or in uh, it does not need hydrogen and oxygen uh, to, to form uh, the oxide, but in wet oxidation you have both hydrogen and oxygen involved. Uh, the difference the, the difference or uh, the reason why you choose either wet oxidation or dry oxidation can be this. Say for example, you, you need uh, a very thin oxide, but a very good quality oxide then you go for uh, dry oxidation where you can have say few nanometers or tens of nanometers of very good quality oxide with very less pinholes and all those things, but uh, you have a limitation in the thickness that you can achieve with dioxidation. But in the case the other case where uh, you want to have a very thick oxide on the top of your vapor, but you are not much bothered about the uh, quality of the oxide that you that you are going to have on the top of your uh, vapor then you may choose uh, wet oxide. You can have a very thin film of wet oxide also on the top of your uh, uh, substrate, but the issue is that uh, the quality of the oxide may not be so great. So, you have to make a choice for what reason you are going to have this oxide whether um, this is just for separation purpose or this is something that is very critical for the. Uh, for the, the the operation of the device. So, if, if it is necessary for the operation of the device definitely you should go for very good quality of uh, uh, oxide otherwise uh, uh, you can go for wet oxidation. And uh, the process that is uh, involved in this oxidation is that you are heating this wafer silicon wafer in the presence of these gases that I have mentioned. Either uh, you are using oxygen uh, for dry oxidation or you are using hydrogen and oxygen for wet oxidation. As you can see in this slide uh, the, the image that I have shown towards the right side, the wafers are stacked in a vertical fashion and these wafers will be heated to a certain temperature. When you are heating these wafer to a certain temperature, uh, there are limits of uh, heating the wafer. Say you are not allowed to uh, uh, heat these wafers beyond a certain temperature because beyond that the wafer will start melting and you will not be able to uh, use that wafer for uh, further uses. And there is no use in heating it for lower temperature as well because you are not going to get a good quality oxide on the top of your uh, wafer. So, there are limits upper and lower limits for your uh, temperature in oxidation. Typically people use temperature from say. Um, say 800 degrees Celsius to say 1100 degrees Celsius or maximum 1150 degrees Celsius. And then uh, with this heating you are going to uh, supply the uh, required gases into the chamber and these gases uh, for dry oxidation as I said you will be supplying only oxygen uh, whereas for the uh, wet oxidation you will be uh, supplying uh, both oxygen and hydrogen. 